Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today for the volunteer screening webinar. My name is Katie and I am an agency relations account specialist at Second Harvest Heartland. Today we are very pleased to have Jessica Haltgren, Director of Volunteer Services at Second Harvest Heartland, presenting the webinar for us. Jessica will be sharing some best practices around screening, uh, sample documents, and additional resources that you will be able to use to screen your volunteers. I hope you all received the email with a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and some of these sample documents from Second Harvest Heartland Volunteer Services. If you did not receive it, please just let me know. Uh, you can chat it into the question box and I can email you a copy right now. Before we get started, I want to cover just a couple of quick housekeeping details. Your lines are all muted, so you don't need to worry about any background noise. If you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to enter them in the question box. This is located in the control panel, which is the box that is to the right of your screen. We'll also be asking you to respond to some questions by typing into this box. We've saved some time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions as well. Click on the hand icon to raise your hand and we can unmute your line so that you can ask your question out loud. You can also contact your account specialist or Jessica after the webinar with any additional questions. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be accessible on Agency Zone within the next few days. Watch for a follow-up email and we will give you the link to that uh, recording, a uh, copy of the PowerPoint presentation again and those additional resources, and also uh, a link to the webinar evaluation. So please do give us your feedback when you receive that link to the evaluation. And now I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Jessica to talk about volunteer screening best practices. All right, thank you, Katie. Um, as Katie mentioned, I'm the Director of Volunteer Services here at Second Harvest Heartland. Um, prior to working here, I spent nine years at Big Brothers Big Sisters, and um, a lot of my experience in this area under this subject matter comes from Big Brothers Big Sisters. Um, so I will say our intent is to give you um, some very pragmatic um, tips and resources for volunteer screening in hopes that you can you know, quickly apply them and use them. I'll also say um, that we, you know, we don't do all of these things expertly at Second Harvest Heartland, so we're kind of in process of learning as well. Um, the other disclaimer I will give you is that um, this is my first webinar, and I'm panicking a little bit because I saw um, one of you in the audience has the same name as my realtor, so it's a little worried that somehow my realtor got on the line, but anyway, uh, so bear with me. Um, we are going to start actually um, with just getting some audience input and participation. I have a question for you. Um, so that question is, have you ever encountered issues with a volunteer that could have been prevented through more thorough screening? And if you could take a few minutes here in the question box and describe any situations I'll give, um, give you a few minutes to do that, and what I'd like to do is refer back to some of these issues or examples um, throughout the presentation, or at the end even. So I'm just going to take a, a little bit of time here and let you answer that question. All right, I haven't uh, seen anything show up yet, but I will um, just ask if you could, um, you know, take the time to do that throughout the presentation because I just think it'll add some some value to the, the rest of the attendees. Um, and I'll start by sharing my own example here at Second Harvest Heartland. Uh, last summer, uh, we decided that we were going to take a, a certain volunteer position that we hadn't had um, been doing background checks for. And um, we were going to start doing background checks on them. So 
the, this was a client-facing, very public position, and so we gathered up all the folks and we said, no, we are having this new policy and we're going to, um, you know, be doing background checks on you with your consent. And so once we did that, um, there were a couple people who opted out, and one person who didn't, and then his um, background check came back, not fitting, no longer fitting our criteria. He had some offenses on there that we did not um, deem were appropriate, and so we had to let that person go. And that was a, um, you know, a kind of a difficult process for everybody because we had been volunteering, so we realized. Um, you know, we were a doing our clients a disservice by um, you know putting this person with a criminal history in front of them, but also we were doing the volunteer disservice because um, you know we should have been screening him before he started. So that is an example that we have, and I do see um, some people are typing in here, so um, we will refer back to these. Thank you for doing that. Um, so my next slide. Up here. Um, answer is why, why should we do volunteer screening? And again, I'm going to refer a lot here to my experience with Big Brothers Big Sisters. Um, so the number one reason I feel is that appropriate and thorough volunteer screening manages risk to your organization. And um, as volunteer managers or however you sit in your organization, you will be wanting to think about risk, um, not only within your department, but with other areas of the organization in the various ways um, not properly screening can present risk. I think um, when we go through the examples that the rest of the group has, has shared, we'll see some of those hopefully. Um, the second, second point is that good volunteer screening promotes long-term retention. And I think um, hopefully we all know that as being volunteer managers. But if you do the, the work on the front end, it saves you time on the back end. And so finding that good fit with volunteers really takes place in the screening process. And again, um, talking about my days at Big Brothers Big Sisters, a lot of work and time went into um, finding the right fit, not only with the organization, but between the volunteer and the child uh, that they were mentoring. And we knew, um, you know, statistically, the better fit that we made in their match um, the longer the child would probably have a mentor in their lives. Um, the other thing, um, it saves work and time for you, again, in the long run. And so um, good screening and good matching uh, will, um, prevents you from having to deal with turn, um, high turnover and kind of that churning cycle that we have. Um, there are a couple volunteer positions here at Second Harvest Heartland that we are just constantly cycling people through. And so very recently, we've had to take a look at, you know, what are we doing wrong in our screening process? So I, I can talk about that a little bit more. And then the final piece is that um, appropriate and thorough volunteer screening really validates your organization and gives you a legitimacy. Um, you know, you definitely don't want to convey that you'll take anybody um, because I think I think volunteers like to know that they are part of an organization that, um, you know, uses discretion and, you know, professional strategies and whatnot. So, again, um, another example of this at Big Brothers Big Sisters is um, we knew that, um, that the public knew we were very good at volunteer screening, and so sometimes people, um, you know, with questionable backgrounds were deterred from ever being involved with us because they knew just how good we were at that. Um, let's see. Okay. So really, um, the, the basis of volunteer screening starts with kind of the framework that you put together. And um, that, to me, goes back to, you know, laying the foundation through your policies and standard um, job descriptions and those types of things. So, um, I think having a, a written background check policy is very important because it tells the public, you know, what your standards are, that you are doing background checks for certain roles, and who you're going to be screening in and out based upon the feedback. So I think Katie um, 
sent out a, a sample of our policy prior to the um, presentation. And if you didn't get that, we'll definitely send that out. Um, another important policy is our confidentiality policy that tells volunteers, you know, whatever we learn about you in your background will be kept confidential, including things like your social security number, your criminal background, your address, those types of things. And, and also tells volunteers that we will be keeping information about clients and our organization and our donors that they will be asked to keep that confidential. Is another basic policy that I would start with. Um, and then another another one that we haven't always had here at Second House Heartland, but we've, we've had to use it now, is a termination policy. And so that just talks about the terms by which um, we decide you know, when and how we're going to let volunteers go. And the way our policy is written is basically we reserve the right to blank, and you really do. Um, and if you have the benefit of you know, legal counsel, once you've drafted your policies, if you don't have them already, I would definitely recommend um, running them through um, some sort of legal counsel or HR resource, something along those lines. Um, the next thing is having standard uniform job descriptions that are regularly updated. And um, we do a, another training here at Second Harvest Heartland, and it's all about um, you know, dealing with difficult situations that come up with volunteers. And a lot of times, difficult situations um, can be addressed or avoided on the front end by having appropriate updated job descriptions. Because when um, a volunteer is doing something that they shouldn't, you can always refer back to the job description. And um, again, I believe Katie included that in the materials that we sent out ahead of time. Another thing you always want to consider is a waiver. Um, we have a very lengthy volunteer waiver. Um, hopefully you've seen that as well. And it covers everything. It covers confidentiality. Um, it covers risk, um, hold harmless, media. It just is, you know, comprehensive as we think it needs to be. Again, this is something that we spend a lot of time on um, within the organization and then also with attorneys to make sure that we really cover ourselves there. So these are all kind of the building blocks of what I think is um, good volunteer screening because you're kind of saying, you know, we are going to be upholding ourselves to these standards and these are the things that we fall back on. Um, the next thing I'm going to say, and maybe we can use some examples here um, that you've all typed in, but uh, you really want to be asking yourself, what is the appropriate level at which I will be screening or assessing this volunteer? And it really depends um, on a variety of different things. And um, I included some examples here. But it should relate back to the volunteer role. So things you want to be asking yourself. Will the volunteer be working directly with clients? If so, you definitely want to have you know, a variety of layers um, that you're doing. You don't just want to um, you know, let anybody come through the door. And the example we have here at Second Harvest Heartland is we have you know, several hundred volunteers that work with clients directly. And of course, we screen those people. Um, but we have thousands and thousands of volunteers who um, come to our warehouse to sort and repack food. We don't screen those people at all. Um, they, you know, at that volume, we just can't. And so they sign up for volunteer. They come. They're supervised by our staff, and um, you know, all is well. They sign our waiver. And so, be thinking about as you're looking at your various different volunteer roles. What elements of screening are you going to include? Um, other questions to ask, what is the level of direct staff supervision? In the example that I use in our warehouse, there's um, a lot of direct supervision, so that there's little risk there. Um, but if you have somebody you know, working eight hours a day and they only check in with their supervisor for the first 10 minutes, they're going to need probably some more thorough screening. Another big thing to be thinking about is what information will the volunteers have access to? I think we all know um, 
you know, from identity theft and other things that are happening out in the world that people can do a lot of damage with information. So when you think about volunteers, do they have access to your donor database? Do they have access to the client or volunteer databases? Do they have access to your financials or proprietary information? If they do, you definitely want to be doing some good screening steps there. Um, other questions, what level of autonomy will the volunteer have? Um, will the work take place in your facilities or out in the community is another big one. And um, will they be re representing you to the broader public? Um, we just started a speaker's uh, ambassador program at Second Harvest Heartland and we are screening um, those people very extensively because they are going to be out there representing us um, across the community. So those are important questions to be asking. And I'm going to try to just look at my question box here. Um, so it looks like, sorry, I'm having a hard time reading my little box, but um, Lou, Jerry Lou, asked, um, she had issues, um, and her question was, yes, asking early whether or not um, a volunteer has been a client. So again, if you have a policy um, about clients volunteering, definitely that's something to assess um, sooner rather than later. Um, and so maybe later we can have Jerry talk a little bit more about that. Um, it looks like Brian has some examples. I might have to go back to this because I'm having a hard time reading it. So I'm going to move along um, to the next slide, and that is um, critical elements of screening. So as I mentioned at Big Brothers Big Sisters, we leveraged every screening tool possible. We were extremely extensive in our screening because there was a ton of risk involved. Um, so a very um, good starting point is having a volunteer application. And in most cases, I would recommend it's good that that application is standardized. So I just clicked on a link to our online volunteer application. And you can see it very, very basic. It's just a volunteer, what position they're applying for, and then their name, address, um, contact information, emergency contact information, employer, and then some very basic questions. Along with that, they're online agreeing to our waiver release and confidentiality agreement. Um, so, you know, a, one standard application is, is important. The next thing is the background check. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, you know, you don't always have to do a background check on your volunteers, depending on what they do. Um, but I would definitely, you know, err on the side of caution here. There are um, lots of affordable background check resources. And um, it's an important step in, in most cases. So again, I just quickly linked to our form. We actually have um, a, a paper form in an electronic way where they can submit their background check. Um, the vendor that we use, which I'll talk about a little bit more, is the McDowell Agency. And we were connected to them a long time ago through MAVA. Um, the one thing I want to say about background checks is I think um, it's common for organizations to say we just can't afford that. They're expensive, especially if they're doing several hundred a year. And my response to that is you can't afford not to. I think in the example that we used, um, had uh, people found out we had this volunteer um, working at Second Harvest Heartland and God forbid they did something, um, we would have been in a world of hurt. And um, so it is very, very important to be doing background checks um, if you can. And um, one of the things, when I was at Big Brothers Big Sister, we went through a transition where we were paying for background checks. And you, you, know, um, you know, they can cost anywhere from $20 to $40, $50, depending on where the people live. And so we started asking our volunteers to help offset the cost of that. And that was a hard transition for us to make, but it, you know, volunteers do not balk at it. We just said it's part of the application process. 
And if they weren't accepted, we didn't refund the money. Um, but you can choose to do that. And I think um, you need to frame it up and it's a, you know, if it offsets our costs, it's a donation to the organization and um, something to consider anyway. Um, the other thing that you want to think about doing is if the volunteer is driving on your behalf, like doing meal delivery or visiting clients or transporting product, you definitely want to be checking their um, motor vehicle record. And oftentimes, um, if they have extensive violations to their motor vehicle record, um, lots of speeding tickets or whatnot, that will show up in the background check as well. But it's just another layer to consider, um, especially when people are driving, um, doing business for you. And we, um, we do a lot of motor vehicle checks. We do them on interns. We do them on um, you know, homebound people who deliver to homebound se seniors. So, those are a little more affordable, um, and so I think I have some resources later in the, in the presentation for that as well. Um, the next big piece, which I'll talk more about in the next slide, is the volunteer interview, and um, that is also an important step, and honestly, um, we are just here at Second Harvest Heartland being a little more um, strategic and, and thorough in our interview process. I would say, up to a year ago, we were doing what I would call an overview with the volunteer and kind of saying, well, they've already been accepted. Of course, they're going to volunteer with us. So this is just more of an overview versus an interview where we're kind of checking each other out and um, assessing on both sides whether it's a good fit. And so I'll talk more about that. But I think um, it's probably pretty common where we're all just desperate for extra help. And so if somebody knocks on our door and they seem um, normal and like they're going to work out, we don't bother with this step. And I think it's an important one. Another one um, is references. We do not do references very often here um, at Second Harvest Heartland. We might for some internships, but not for any other of our volunteer positions. But it is another um, a tool that you have available to you. And um, for sure at Big Brothers Big Sisters, because again, there was so such high risk, um, we, we did that. And so the reference check can be something to add. Again, not something that we do here at Second Harvest, but you could um, implement some sort of social media search into your screening um, process. I have a friend who recently was applying for a volunteer board position. And um, in the kind of the vetting process, they came back to her and they said, well, we noticed this, this, and this on Facebook. And she, of course, was mortified. But there are organizations, um, and not that it was anything bad, but um, you know, it was meant for her social network, not her professional network. And so um, that is a tool, again. Um, I couldn't tell you how you, um, you know, standardize that, but I, I do know that people do that. Um, and then the last piece I put in here is training. And I consider training as a screening tool as well, because you can um, require that volunteers complete training before you accept them into certain roles. And, um, and that is a time and opportunity for you to engage with them and kind of see them interact with others and how are they responding to the information. And it was something that we relied heavily on, again, at Big Brothers Big Sisters, is watching the volunteers at training and um, you know, were they engaged, were they participating. How are they um, treating their fellow participants? So I do think that's a screening step, and you can consider not doing training or not accepting someone until they have completed training. Um, Jessica, this is Katie. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more just about the references. I said I know you said that at Second Harvest we do not usually do references, but um, at Big Brothers, Big Sisters, just what that process looked like, um, if you were doing phone references or email or um, how, how that process can look at a different organization. Can you hear? I hope you can hear me. I think I'm on. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. People can hear me. It says. Um, so in regards to references, again, um, 
I'll just go back to my experience at Big Boy Six Sisters. We would not match anybody until we had three references um, for them. So we, in their application, would ask for, I think, five or six references in hopes of getting three. And so it's pretty extensive, and that is, you know, as you might imagine, pretty time consuming. Um, our first preference, and I, I can't recall, it's been a while, but I feel like we had set some sort of standard where one of the references for sure had to be a phone reference and the other two could be written. Um, we had standards of how long they knew the person and what capacity, so they couldn't be like all coworkers or um, professional references. And again, the reference questions should relate back to the job that you're hiring them for. And so in the case of Big Brothers Big Sisters, we ask a lot of questions about you know, their experience working with kids, their flexibility, their cultural competency, um, their dependability. Um, had the reference seen them interacting with kids? Would the reference leave them alone with their own children? Um, those types of things. And so um, I, I think, you know, as far as screening tools go, those are very, very helpful um, if you have you know, the time to invest in them. So um, hopefully that answers your question, um, Katie. So, yes, thank you. And I also wanted to let you know that I'm, I can read off those uh, responses from folks if we want to do that. Otherwise, you should be able to pop out that box so you can see them better. I don't know why I cannot see this. Maybe if you want to just take a few, um, stop here and ask them, that would be great. Sure, sounds good. So um, we have a couple things here. Um, you mentioned from Jerry asking uh, early whether they had been a client. Uh, we have um, here coordinating volunteers in a domestic violence shelter, and one struggle that we have had was how best to screen previous clients who are interested in being volunteers or interns and how they are or where they are at in their healing process. So kind of a similar question, but a little bit more um, of an involvement with the organization maybe in that case. So, yep, and just a couple comments about how um, it would have prevented a number of issues that had escalated to client or to crisis. So, Ryan, maybe we can have you talk a little bit more about that uh, later on, too. Okay, um, thanks for those. And um, I think we can get into the kind of the client discussion in a little bit. Um, we do not have uh, a policy here about clients as volunteers, past or current. Um, but I, I think that's recommended for a lot of organizations. And so um, my recommendation would be to just start with a policy and determining as an organization um, what, what that policy is going to be and does it work for you. Um, and then as far as assessing where they're at in the healing process, um, I think we can kind of get into that a little bit here when we talk about maximizing the volunteer interview. Um, and so this is probably highly redundant and maybe not that valuable, but I just want to kind of um, overview some things about interviewing. Um, in, in my opinion, I don't know that a volunteer interview is much different than when you're interviewing for, you know, employment. Um, so the thing that I start with is that the process should be clearly communicated to the volunteer, including the contingencies. So what I'm saying here is, um, you know, you should be telling them, okay, we got your application, thank you, we'd like to schedule you for an interview. Um, your acceptance into this position will be determined by X, Y, and Z, and you'll be notified after your interview of your acceptance. Um, and being very straightforward about that and, um, you know, full disclosure, as I mentioned at Second Harvest, we were more doing an overview. And so volunteers did, you know, we never kind of said, well, if it seems like this isn't a good fit, we're going to be not accepting you. And so you really need to be clear about that up front. It's like a job. Um, again, I think the standards should or the questions should always be standardized. Um, 
like, you know, again, when you're hiring for a, a position, you want to be asking people the exact same questions. Um, and of course, it's okay to add, you know, additional questions, but I think um, you want documentation to show that you've covered your bases, for one, and that you're treating people fairly, for two. Um, again, this happened at Big Brothers Big Sisters a lot. They had a very extensive interview. It took oftentimes more than an hour, and um, I think it was 13 pages long. I don't know. It was very long. Um, and, and we asked a lot of different questions, and sometimes people would skip over certain questions that they, you know, didn't care for or um, were uncomfortable asking. And it, it created risk to the organization, quite frankly, um, that they weren't asking them. So standardize your interview. Um, the other one is that the interview should be documented um, in the volunteer file. Even if you don't accept them, you want to be able to go back and say, well, we did this step and this is what they told us and, you know, this is part of the process. And um, document retention, I think, is a big one in volunteer screening. Um, for that, you know, one instance where things go wrong. Um, I put number four in here. This is simply my own opinion, not based upon a best practice, but I do think that the volunteer interview should be conducted by staff versus volunteers. And, um, you know, I think you could have a trusted, highly trained volunteer do interviews, but I do think um, it's just for, from a liability perspective better to have it conducted by staff. Um, number five, at the close of your interview, you should have, um, there should be some sort of brief written assessment on why you're accepting them or not. Um, again, going back to kind of the paper trail, I would say. Um, and then finally, there should be an official acceptance process. And um, this is another one that we are not doing the greatest job of here, but um, at Big Brothers Big Sisters, everybody had in their file a letter, whether it was that they were accepted or not accepted. Um, and I think that is definitely a, be a best practice. And in addition to that, um, you, you know, oftentimes I think it's the best practice if you're not accepting a volunteer that you do that by phone versus letter, um, just as kind of a, a courtesy step. Um, okay, so let me, oh, it looks like someone here wrote into the group that said that they have a template you can use to spell out if clients or past clients can be volunteers. Oh, you wrote that, Katie. <laughs> All right, good to know. Yes, if you, um, you can always contact your account specialist if you do have uh, questions about that. And if you do have uh, clients that are also volunteering, we recommend having a process that or a, a policy in place that just outlines um, that they're not receiving food as, a, as payment for volunteering. All right, thank you. That's good to know. Um, so what are we assessing in the volunteer interview? Um, I think this is probably the most valuable time you spend in the screening process is the interview. Um, so I just put out some standard things um, that I think you always want to consider um, when, when working with volunteers. And um, so I'm going to quickly run through those. Uh, the first one is the, their motivation. Um, why do they want to volunteer? I think that will tell you a lot. Um, to see if they're a fit for the job and a fit for the organization. And it will also help you figure out how to keep them engaged. Um, and people volunteer for a lot of different reasons. They might volunteer because, you know, for the social aspect. So you don't want to put them in a position where they're working alone, for example. Um, the second one is you want to assess their relevant skills. And we run into this or have a lot um, here at Second Harvest Heartland, particularly with computer and technology skills. Um, we haven't found a good way to assess that. So people will say, yeah, I'm good with a computer. And then um, you know, we'll learn once they get into our database, like they're not getting it. And we've often had to go back to these folks and say, you know, we've trained and trained and trained, and, um, and they're still not getting it. And so then we have to say, you know, we think you're probably going to be a better fit in a different role. But by that time, we've probably wasted a lot of their time and a lot of our time. And, um, you know, nobody's walking away feeling really good about it. So 
Assessing the skills for the job is important. Um, availability and schedule is, is another important one. Um, as you all know, I'm not going to get into that. And then similarly, the level of commitment. And this is one where we just hammered home at Big Brothers Big Sisters because the commitment was a full year. And the reason that we stressed and stressed that we need a full year commitment is because we're working with vulnerable children who have been let down by adults in the past. And if you can't make a full year commitment or you think you might not be able to, this is not the role for you. And so um, that may not be the case for all of your um, volunteer positions, but again, you want to be understanding, you know, is this person in it for how long I need them to be in it, whether it's, you know, six months or a year or what have you. Um, number five, I think, is also very important, and I think um, probably one where we're not as skilled at or we feel uncomfortable, and that's assessing their values, attitudes, and beliefs. And it is perfectly um, acceptable for you to be asking value-based questions of your volunteers if it pertains to the work that you're doing. So, um, for example, we do SNAP outreach here at Second Harvest Heartland. So we should really be assessing whether or not our volunteers in this program are supportive of, of that, um, you know, highly political program um, and what their thoughts are around that. And um, I have seen firsthand um, a lot of times working in food shelves where volunteers will have this attitude of like, well, you know, how are these people getting this benefit? And they don't seem like they really need it. And, um, you know, sort of that mentality, um, you can and should be assessing for that. Um, so I think um, the, the piece here is figuring out the questions and um, what you're assessing and how it fits with the job. Another similar one is cultural competency. I think if you're working with, if they're working directly with clients, you definitely want to be assessing that. Um, again, this is something that we haven't done in the past, and we've had problems, and they are problems um, that are felt and experienced by your clients, and we're definitely not okay with that, and so you need to be assessing those things on the front end. Is a volunteer's ability and willingness to work with different cultures. Um, the last thing I will say is um, definitely legitimize your gut feelings about volunteers. And um, again, this is something in my nine years at Big Brothers Big Sisters, um, we kind of went back and forth on um, as a philosophy. When I first started there, they were like, yes, your gut feeling is definitely something to consider. And then, and then we went away from that thinking, well, we don't want to have bias. And then we went back to, yes, trust your gut feeling. Um, and I think all of us have been there um, where something just doesn't feel right. And I think, um, you know, before you start not accepting volunteers based upon gut feeling, you kind of want to get organizational support behind that. Um, but, you know, we have that sense for a reason. And um, I think kind of the example that started this whole topic um, was you know something that came out in the paper about a, a, a local organization that they had a gut feeling about a volunteer, and although he was never convicted criminally, he had a record of um, you know victimizing children, and so people within the organization were not feeling the greatest about him, um, but didn't have the facts to support that, and so. I would really encourage you all to um, incorporate that into your screening process. Um, you know, in order to kind of avoid what looks like bias, um, you can have other people do a second interview with a volunteer to see if they pick up on the same thing. Um, you can invite the volunteer to training and have, you know, your colleagues kind of observe and watch them. You can put them on a probation period. Um, and so definitely um, always consider that because it is an important piece. Um, let's see. Um, interviewing tips, I'm not going to spend a ton of time, wow, it's already 11.40. Um, 
on that. I think um, always make sure you have an appropriate place and a sufficient time for the interview and prepare for the tough conversations. Um, when I was at Big Brothers Big Sisters, part of the interview process was that we had to ask people um, had they ever been abused as a child, what was their sexual orientation. Um, when I first started there, we had to ask them um, actually, you know, were they sexually active? We had to ask them their um, religious background. And so um, as a young person entering the workforce, that was so insanely hard. And so if you have tough questions that you know you're going to be asking, you want to kind of role play those and um, practice your script around that. And also, um, you know, learn to be comfortable with what, what people tell you. Um, so there are definitely tough conversations that evolve and you just want to be prepared for those. Um, again, listen more than you talk. I think um, volunteers have, anybody, actually, it's human nature. Uh, long, uncomfortable silence makes us um, uncomfortable. And so when you're listening, people are more inclined to fill that um, void by talking. Um, and they'll tell you things during that time. So um, it is very important that you are talking less um, than the volunteer in this case. Um, use open-ended questions. We've all heard that. Avoid leading questions. We've all heard that. And then avoid the halo effect. So um, those are just, you know, basic recommendations that I would give you. Um, now, it's, I, it looks like here there's some questions about additional resources. I see one, the cost of background check. So I have put up here, um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of these, um, but I just put them up some some you know, local resources that you have available to you. So the first one is MAVA, the Minnesota Association for Volunteer Administration. Membership ranges based upon, um, I think, the size of your organization and how many people you would like to be members. It's an individual membership. Um, it offers a lot of different trainings. Um, they have a great two-day um, volunteer leadership impact series that covers kind of soup to nuts volunteer administration. Um, and incidentally, the next opportunity that they are offering this um, is April 21st and 22nd at Second Habitat Land in Golden Valley, and it's specifically geared for hunger relief organizations. So um, I don't know for certain um, that there are spots still available, but we can definitely look into that if, if people are interested. They um, then have ongoing topic-based workshops. That Sorry, I just wanted to add, there are still spots available, and if cost is an issue for you, please contact your account specialist. Thank you, Katie. Um, so MAVA also has ongoing topic-based workshops. Um, they have their um, great uh, conference coming up here in May. Um, that's in the Twin Cities. They have that every other year. It's a very extensive conference. Um, and then they have a great online resource library as well. Um, and then the other resource is Hands-On Twin Cities. Um, their membership with them also ranges um, based upon um, the size of your organization. And they have a, also a lot of um, workshops and training opportunities um, in a variety of formats. They have um, a networking um, group that they use, also have an online resource library. And then um, the thing that I like most about Hands-On is their um, volunteer recruitment portal. And so you can post your volunteer positions um, on their portal and kind of reach a very, very broad audience. Um, they do have consulting services available. And um, they do a lot of um, marketing and PR. Um, I'm sure you've seen the 11 Who Care. I think that's a program um, in partnership with Hands-On. So, there's a lot of neat um, resources there. Um, and then finally, to address um, the question here of cost of background checks, um, so I have linked here to a couple places. Um, so first, verified volunteers. They are new to the Twin Cities market. And what is unique about them um, is that if you are a client of theirs, um, and you have a volunteer who say they've already done a back with YMCA, and now they want to come volunteer with you. If, if, if YMCA is also a client of Verified, you get that background check for free, or very low cost. 
Um, and so it's kind of like the power is in the masses. The more people who are um, clients of Verified, the better it is for all of us. Um, I think it's been in the communities now for probably a year and a half, and I haven't checked to see how many local organizations they have. But that is a great way, I think, collectively we can pool our resources. Um, again, we use the McDowell Agency, and um, we were connected to them through, um, through MAVA. And generally speaking, their checks run about um, $20, and you can get different levels of checking um, and what you want them to check. So the cost goes up or down depending on that. Um, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension is a free resource, and um, I <laughs> I've never used this before, but I tried to test it here and just put myself in. Um, unfortunately, in this instance, I don't have a criminal record, so nothing came up. So I don't <laughs> want to find somebody who I could test this with to see what actually comes up. Um, but it is free. You just have to get volunteer consent. So something else to consider. Um, and then going back up to the top, I found um, this really cool handbook that I would encourage you all to look at, and it's um, through Volunteer Canada, and it's their whole handbook on volunteer screening. Oops, that didn't work. Um, I can resend you the link. But it's a lengthy document, well-organized, well-written, and so I thought I would put that up there because I thought it was well done. Um, and then the Points of Lay at Research Resource Library, um, as many of you probably know, um, Points of Light is the umbrella organization for hands-on. Um, and so they um, have a great resource library. And I actually don't think you need to be a member um, or a client to access this. Oops, what did I do here? Um, the other thing I noted here is um, I would recommend leveraging interns or other volunteers to help you with your volunteer screening efforts. They may not be able to, um, to actually do the interviews, but they definitely could help be doing um, kind of the paperwork and the documentation and those different pieces. And so I would encourage you to think more about that. I think a lot of us don't do certain things we should be doing because we don't think we have the time or the capacity. And again, I think interns could help you with that or other volunteers. As I mentioned before, ask applicants to help offset the cost of their background check. And then finally, I would say start small. Um, that is what we had to do here at Second Harvest because it was just too much um, to do it all at once. So we would take one job at a time, one pool of volunteers and say, okay, Here's our policy. Here's what we're going to check for them. Um, you know, we did everybody retroactively and then set up business processes for going forward. Um, and then we moved on to the next job and the next job and the next job. And we're still not there yet, um, but it is much more manageable to do it that way, I feel, than trying to do it all in one shell. All right. So 